Hello everyone. Hope you're having a great, great morning. I'm a little bit frazzled on my end today. I'm in the process of making my tournament master class. I'm on slide 250 or so. And I um, wanted to confirm I was right about something. And that was the minimum defense frequency. So we're going to be discussing minimum defense frequency today. And you all can ask me whatever questions you have. And that'll be good. Before we get started, I do have a webinar today. So I can find you all a link. Mm, give me just a second. It's gonna be with Michael Acevedo. He's going to be breaking down my play in a recent $1,000 buy-in tournament I played online where I took third place. I think that's what we're gonna be going over. He says they're having blackouts where he is right at the moment. So there's a chance that his power may be out. So we may have to cancel, but that's at 4 p.m. Eastern today, so check it out. Actually, I thought about this topic like literally one second ago because I wanted to confirm I was right about minimum defense frequency, so I asked a few people and they actually said I was wrong about something. I'm like, mm, don't think I'm wrong. So I um, asked the expert, Michael Acevedo, he wrote this book, <sighs> great book, Modern Poker Theory. Um, I asked the expert and the expert said I was right. So it's always good to know that I'm still right and still know what I'm doing. It's good to be competent. Good to be competent. Let's put this right here. Think that'll stay? Maybe we'll. So I just posted a link to that. If you um, would like to sign up to the webinar and for some reason you can't use that link, you can just go to twitter.com slash Jonathan Little. The link should be right near the top. So check that out. So minimum defense frequency, what is it? Minimum defense frequency is how often you need to defend against a bet if you are trying to be unexploitable. So right off the bat, you should know that you're very often not trying to be unexploitable. And for that reason, sometimes minimum defense frequency does not apply. For example, if your opponent is a super nit, they literally fold every or they literally fold everything and then they raise, well, you should be defending way less than a minimum defense frequency, right? That said, minimum defense frequency is an important number, and I'm gonna show you how to figure it out. So the most obvious example is let's say you raise to three big blinds from under the gun plus one, and the low jack, three bets. To 10 big blinds. Okay? Minimum defense frequency is 1 minus the opponent's bet divided by the opponent's bet plus the pot. Okay? Nice, clear, easy example. If you're watching this on Instagram, sorry, you're not going to be able to see the math that I'm showing everyone else on the screen. You can watch this at youtube.com slash poker coaching and you'll see the chat and what everyone else is saying on what You'll see the chat and this text. So, if I can make this a little bit bigger. Okay, good. So, in this scenario, minimum defense frequency is roughly, because minimum defense frequency is, act, minimum defense frequency is actually divided by everyone else in the pot, but minimum defense frequency is roughly 1 minus your opponent's bet, which was 10 big blinds, divided by <clears throat> the total pot plus your opponent's bet, which is 10 plus your 3 plus the 1 big blind plus the 0.5 small blinds, plus the one big blind, which equals about 35%. That means you need to defend with at least 35% of your range. A lot of people get in trouble because they hear at least, and they think, okay, only 35%. But oh, no, 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 no. You actually need to be defending more than the minimum defense frequency in most spots, especially when your hands have a decent amount of equity, right? And before the flop, if you're playing reasonable ranges, then you will have a lot of equity in a lot of scenarios. Why are various charts different? One of them is based on how to play against the player pool, and so then some of the other ones are GTO. We have various charts on poker coaching. Some of them are against the player pool, some of them are against GTO, and um, that is mentioned on the, on the website. If it's confusing to you, let, let me know. The ones that are GTO say GTO. So this is very basic minimum defense frequency. Nothing difficult about this. Let me show you where 
People were confused though. Let's instead take this scenario. You raise a 2.75 big blinds from the hijack and the big blind three bets. Why don't I have three bets twice? Big blind three bets to 12 big blinds. Now, what's the minimum defense frequency? This is where the discrepancy came in. It's pretty sure I was right. But, now I know I'm right because Michael Acevedo, the expert, told me. <clears throat> you're actually looking at the amount of money your opponent puts in on top of the amount of money they already have in the pot. So in this situation, big blind already has in one big blind, right? So this number is 12 minus the amount of money that the opponent already has in the pot. So instead of it being one minus 12 divided by, some people put 12 here as well, it's not accurate, 12 plus 11 point, or 2.75 plus 1 plus 0.5 plus 1, it's actually 11. Notice here this number on the bottom is just the entire pot, right? This 11 is the opponent's raise on top of their amount that they already had in, which was the one which is already accounted for. And this um, always applies to any scenario. If it goes like raise to three big blinds, your opponent three bets, and then you four bet, your initial raise gets subtracted from the front number. Okay? Very important concept a lot of people forget about. Also, like I said, minimum defense frequency is actually divided by the players yet to act. So if this is small blind and big blind, it is... You know, like small blind raises, it is fully on the big blind to defend at roughly the minimum defense frequency or more. If you raise from under the gun, well, now everyone at the table has to effectively defend that number divided by, let's say, eight, if there are eight players yet to act. It's not exactly like that because the button needs to defend more, the big blind needs to defend more, but it's close enough. It's an estimation, right? So if minimum defense frequency is, let's say, 35%, the real number divided by nine is, what, 4% each? Obviously, you're going to defend 4% each, right? Because 4% is just only the nuts. So, I wanted to point that out because two pretty good players I asked got that wrong. And if two pretty good players I am asking got that wrong, then I'm going to presume that a lot of people would have gotten that wrong. What should your average expected big blind per hour be in cash games? Depends on who you're playing against and how much the rake is. Is this 35% of your original opening range? Yes, but at least, at least, at least, at least, at least. Please recognize it is at least. It is not 35 period. Where'd the last big blind come from? This here, this is the ante. This number is the ante. Big blind, small blind, ante. Don't forget you have to account for the big blind and the small blind and the ante. So the big blind is not counted twice here. The big blind is only counted once. And notice here, this 11 is not part of the, th that does not include the opponent's big blind in that scenario when they made it 12. So you want to make sure you're accounting for everything. Everything that is there. Adam, if you're having questions about how to use our charts, please send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com. The ones that do not say that they are GTO, are not GTO. The ones that say they are GTO are based on Munker Solver. Do you really think it's necessary to pay attention to preflop ranges? Yes, I think it's very important to play, with pre -flop, to play attention to preflop ranges because if your opponents play anywhere near competently, what's going to happen is if you raise too wide and they three bet you with reasonable ranges, you're not going to be able to defend quite often enough. So something else a lot of people don't quite understand is that pot odds and minimum defense frequency are not the same. A lot of people get this very confused and they think that this is, that they are the same number, but they're not. Pot, every hand in your continuing range needs to realize at least the amount of equity required by your pot odds, okay? So let's scout the calculator. In this scenario, figure out our pot odds here. We have to put in, let's just do the first scenario because it's easier. We have to put in seven big blinds into a pot that's going to be 21.5. Okay? So we do seven divided by 21.5 equals. Every hand that we continue with needs to realize at least 33% equity to justify continuing. And understand that you just can't run your hand against your opponent's range and see what that is because you are going to under-realize your equity 
as the preflop caller most of the time and with the hands that are not premium hands. So you're actually gonna find that the big offsuit hands typically under-realize their equity and you're often going to find that the that when you're out of position, you're going to under-realize your equity. So that is going to make it difficult for you. Do you have any webinars on bubble play and late games? Yes, of course we do, Snoop. We have a website, pokercoaching.com. We have many, 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 many videos explaining all sorts of things, including any logical question that you have. Certainly there's some corner cases that may not be explained thoroughly yet, but if they're not, send me an email and I'll make it. What's the best way to defend against a virus at the World Series of Poker? Don't go, obviously, if that's if you care about not getting a virus. Do I live in Vegas? No, I live in New York City. In Manhattan. It's a fun place. If you ever have any questions about the website that are confusing to you, send us an email, right? We're happy to answer it. Someone just sent me an email the other day asking, do we have videos on this? And I searched YouTube for my content and like three different examples of it came up. So first off, search Poker Coaching's YouTube. It's completely free. Go to pokercoaching.com in the classes section. Almost everything's covered. I've done, I think, over 200 30-minute videos on topics that my students ask me specifically to make. And I have a cash game masterclass, et cetera, et cetera. I have lots and lots of content. Where do I play poker in New York City? Oh, I don't. That would be silly. Um, okay. Minimum defense frequency does not necessarily apply when you're trying to exploit your opponents. For example, if your opponent's a super loose aggressive maniac, you need to defend at more than the minimum defense frequency. And if your opponent's a nit, you need to defend at less than the minimum defense frequency. Do we have content on multi-way pots? Of course we do. Were you not just here? I said, just said a second ago, we literally have content on every scenario that you're going to be encountering at pokercoaching.com. Can you naturally be better at one game than the other? Of course you can, and you will be. Typically, looser, splashier, more aggressive players are better at PLO, I think. Do I play PLO? Yes, I've played plenty of PLO. Um, okay, preflop, you should pretty much always be defending at at least the minimum defense frequency unless your opponent's a super net. Next, on the flop, especially when you defended from the big blind, in that scenario, you should be actually drastically under defending on flops that do poorly for your range. When you have a significant range disadvantage, as you will when, let's say, under the gun raises, you call big blind, a flop comes ace, king, four, right? You have no aces, you have no kings. They have aces, kings, maybe even fours. They have ace, king, ace, four suited, right? They have all the nuts and you don't. In that situation, you should be drastically under uh, defending. So when your opponent bets two big blinds in the seven big blind pot, well, minimum defense frequency is high, right? But you should only be defending, I don't even know what it is, 40% of the time or something like that because your range is in such awful shape. But once you make that fold on the flop where you fold out the junk in your range, now on the turn in the river, you very often should be defending somewhere near minimum defense frequency. There are some spots post-flop on the turn of the river where minimum defense frequency does not apply against good players. Um, do we want to go into that? No, it's too much to go into. We need too many graphs. Um, but anyway, that's a situation where on the turn of the river, you want to be defending somewhere near minimum defense frequency and same thing pre-flop. Does it only apply from the small blind and big blind? No, absolutely not. It applies from literally all scenarios. How do you deal with burnout in poker? Don't play so much to the point you get burnt out. With a 40 buy-in bankroll, you feel comfortable. Should you change it? Don't know what that means. Ideally, you're always changing your bankroll, and so ideally always going higher. If you have a big edge, can you get away with defending more? Or do you lose that playing weak hands? Oh, I think you should be defending a lot of hands pre-flop. From in position? Oh, you're saying, like, if someone raises, can you call with, like, 8-4 suited? No, probably not. Um, you may think that you have a big edge, but you don't have a big enough edge to play the absolute trash, unless your opponents are terrible. And for them to be terrible, they either need to be just, like, blindly stacking off every time. So, like, if you make one pair, you're happy. Or you need to... Um, you need to have them just like check folding every flop. If they're doing that, then I guess you can, but most people aren't that bad. 
How do you play 20 to 30 big blind poker? Play fundamentally sound. A lot of people play way too tightly with that stack because they want to get it all in with the super nuts. But in reality, you have to get in there and you have to battle a little bit. Are we talking about cash or tournament or it doesn't matter? We're talking mainly about uh, cash or tournament in the early levels of tournaments. When there are payout implications, folding starts to gain EV. Whereas normally the EV of folding is zero. Good example of folding having EV is um, at a final table bubble, right? If you fold as a medium stack, when there's a tiny stack, you make money. So minimum defense frequency starts to get a little bit weird in that scenario. Where can you play poker in New York City? Underground games, and I have no desire to do that. Is that my new book behind me? No, that book is Michael Acevedo's book. I'm doing a webinar with him tonight, completely for free for you. You can watch it if you sign up. Where can you watch it? Only go to webinar. But the link is, Oops, well, that's not the link. Let's see, I'll send you the link again. Here's the link. If you can't find the link for whatever reason, it's on my Twitter page, at Jonathan Little. Someone puts you all in on the turn, you have the nut flush draw, should you fold or call? Well, Nassad, it depends on your pot odds, right? Obviously. What is expected value actually? Mm, how, do, how deep do we want to go on that? Because there is a difference between expected value and equity. Simply put... It's how much you expect to win out of the pot on average. Basically it. On average, long-term thing. Um, so a reason you can't play wide range, as someone mentioned earlier, is that if you play ranges that are too wide, inevitably those will not, the, the bad hands in that range will not realize the correct amount of pot odds. So every hand in your defending range needs to realize its correct amount of equity, its required amount of equity based on pot odds. And if it does, it's probably going to be within the minimum defense frequency, almost certainly. So you can't get away with playing too much garbage. You only play two to four a month on weekdays mainly. I have no clue what that even means. How many hours should you be studying during the week? Study as much as you can. Depends on how much you care about poker, right? If poker is your life and you want to be the best poker player you can, you should be just you should be studying all the time. Right? We have the nut flush draw. The neat thing about the nut flush draw is it beats all the worst flush draws and it beats um, all the straight draws. And if it's a nut flush draw, it usually has top pair type hand, top pair outs. So Sometimes you should fold, sometimes you shouldn't. If you had to fold it on the turn, you probably screwed up somewhere in the hand, unless your opponent just made some absurd overbet. Do you ever three bet with minimum defense frequency with non-premium hands? Th that, Philip, you're completely misapplying minimum defense frequency. It does not have to deal with your three betting. It has to deal with defending. So I'm not sure exactly what you're saying, but it has to deal with defending, not, not aggressive actions. Whenever you're taking aggressive actions, you want to look at the minimum defense frequency for your opponent. That's relevant. Will there be a replay of the webinar? Yes, of course there will be. All webinars we make will be replayed somewhere. This webinar will be on YouTube. This is completely free for everyone. Jack's on the button, 24 big blinds deep. Men race, obviously. Why do pros rate register, re late register for tournaments? Often because they have more important things to do. A lot of pros, pros, we're going to use pros in quotes, are actually not very good at life management. And they inevitably can't wake up on time because they'd rather be out partying or because they just don't care that much. Um, and, and it probably doesn't actually cost them a ton of equity. It probably costs them a little bit, but not a ton. I do think you probably want to buy in like right on time or you want to, you know, buy. It doesn't really matter after that. Did I break my party poker cup? No, I just happen to have multiple coffee cups. What's my average opening in a 5-5 five -five game? I mean, it depends on my position, right? We have charts at pokercoaching.com. Go check them out. Aaron says you're enjoying poker coaching. Great, I'm glad to hear it. What are the most important things to study for six max sit and goes? ICM, individual chip model. You need to understand payout implications very, very, very well. You're loving Faraz Jaka's content. Yeah, he has a lot of great content in the pipeline. He uh, just put out a class for Poker Coaching Premium, I think. And um, that's exciting. We had a lot of good content coming out recently. Today, I'm probably going to get embarrassed by Michael Acevedo in front of everyone. 
where he's going to be reviewing some hands I played in a $1,000 buy-in online tournament against the literal best players in the world. I was in Nottingham recently and wanted to get him some volume against tough opponents and try to win a poker tournament. Turns out it went well. I won like 45000 bucks and um, got to battle some small field tournaments against, you know, literally the top 20 poker players in the world and me. And turns out we did okay. So that was fun. How is big blind defense connected to stack size? You should actually defend wider from the big blind as your stacks get shallower because whenever you are shallower, you will be able to ease more easily just like check shove and get your stack in. What's a good hourly big blind win rate for one, two? Again, depends on the rate and depends on your opponents. $20 an hour, $25 an hour, 10, 12, that's usually pretty nice. In Felty, this is what we're going for right here. Went through the 30-day challenge at Poker Coaching Premium. It was great, and you won your first online tournament afterwards. Unfortunately, it was a 10-cent tournament. Well, such is life. But, hey, you're winning tournaments, right? And that's exactly what we're going for. Can you play online poker in the United States for real money? You, as a civilian, in most states are allowed to play poker for real money. However, sites are not allowed to offer you games where you have to deposit with U.S. dollars or maybe equivalent in other forms of currency. Maybe. That's the gray area. So what a lot of sites are doing to get around this is to let you use cryptocurrencies. Um, some other sites are using some sweepstakes law to try to get around it, but they're, they're like, they're clearly out of line. Um, so are the crypto sites out of line? Um, probably. Will the government shut them down once they become big enough? Um, but where can you play? There are a few sites that are reasonable. I think Bovada is probably the most reasonable of the bunch of the, of the you know, gray area shady sites. I call it shady. Like, is it shady to get around the laws of the government? Some people think, screw the government. I think um, I don't really want to go to prison for any reason, and I don't want the government to not look fondly upon me. So I pay my taxes, and I don't break the law. Some people don't pay their taxes, and they break the law. And, you know, some people are proud of that. They're proud of um, screwing their country. Whereas, you know, I so some things you don't want to screw with, and the U.S. government seems like one you'd rather not screw with. So Adam says the classic thing that a lot of people say that ruins them, it absolutely wrecks them. X poker site is fine. You have had no problems cashing out. See where you're wrong there? Think about this. Think about this real quick. Just because you have cashed out in the past does not mean you'll be able to cash out in the future. It's very important to recognize. And I mean, like, of the sites where I would actually be concerned about cashing out, I think Global Poker is probably the one that I would be most concerned about cashing out because they're, they're the ones who are really being aggressive with the sweepstakes law. And, you know, it's fine now. It's always fine until it's not. That's the neat thing about this is that everyone feels like they're, they're uh, happy and doing the right things until they are screwed. And they're like, oh, my God, how did this happen? Well, you're not paying attention to history. And it turns out almost every single site, besides Bovada, actually, every single site besides Bovada has, that's operated within America, besides the few that are currently operating, have shut down and um, either taken players' money or taken forever to pay player, players their money. And if you're cool opening yourself up to that, then sure, right? doesn't matter. You know, do whatever you want. But definitely don't keep any money in there that you care about. That's for sure. Any site finding, any luck finding a poker site that can do the free roll that I wanted? Yeah, I think there's some app called Poker, P-O-K-E-R-R-R-R-R-R-R, -R 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 -R, or something like that. I don't really like their software. It's an application on your phone. Don't really love it. But I think that might work. So we'll figure that out. The government doesn't arrest buyers, they arrest the dealers. Um, until they don't, I was very clearly informed by my lawyer that if you act as an affiliate, maybe you call that a, that a dealer, if you act as an affiliate for one of these um, shady poker sites operating in America illegally, then um, you're liable to go to jail. So certainly not going to be an affiliate. There are plenty of people out there who are being affiliates. And... Um, my lawyer, who is one of the absolute best gaming lawyers in the world, said, mm -mm, mm -mm. not if you care about not going to jail, right? I mean, a lot of people don't care if they go to jail or have 1% chance to go to jail. All right, all right, all right. 
How important do you think mindset is? I think it's very important. How can you improve it? Don't be a fish. Realize that a lot of things don't matter. A lot of people like to think about things that don't matter and think that they're very relevant. How do you deal with burnout? Well, you're putting stress on yourself unnecessarily. You're, or you're not enjoying yourself. Why are you not enjoying yourself? It's a mindset. Learn to enjoy yourself at the poker table. If you enjoy yourself, then it's easy. People ask how I can grind making content all day, every day, because I love it. It's fun. It's not hard for me. It's, it's enjoyable. It's hard to detox limping when you've been playing in a game where 70% of players limp. I mean, you should limp sometimes. If people are limping a lot. There's nothing wrong with having a limping range. You should have a limping range. I'm not sure what you're saying here. You should defend more at the minimum defense frequency or more against a against um, players who are playing reasonably well or against... Oh, what, what just happened here? Against players who are too loose. Well, don't know what just happened here. Um, you have 17K. Should you take a shot at 2.5? I would buy in for 2.5 at whatever buy-in you're used to. If you're used to 100 big blinds, $300 at 1.3. Play $500 at 2.5. If you lose $2,000, pack it up and move back down. I already answered this question. Good win rate at 1.2 is 25, 30 bucks. 170 people here. Please leave a like. Yeah, please leave a like, everyone. Click like, click subscribe, click share. Believe it or not, that actually helps me, and it costs you nothing. It doesn't even cost you any time because you're already here. What's your limping range look like? I don't have an open limping range, but I do have limping ranges behind, usually hands that flop very well, or hands that you don't want to raise and they get re-raised. It's important to realize that there are two types of limpers, roughly. There are tricky limpers, and there are are straightforward limpers. Against tricky limpers, you should be limping with like pretty good hands because you don't want to limp and get re-raised off of them. But against straightforward limpers, you should be raising with usually your best hands plus uh, some bluffs, right? And the bluffs are selected differently against the tricky limpers versus the straightforward limpers. Um, so it depends on your opponent. That's the neat thing. People ask, why don't we have charts for when people limp? Because they're limping with all sorts of ranges. If they're open limping to begin with, they're probably screwing up. So if they're screwing up, then why would you use some sort of GTO chart? Because the GTO chart doesn't even have that in the in the calculation because they should not be open limping. Would you ever consider teaching someone in person? Why do you think I've not taught anyone in person? I've taught plenty of people in person. Let's see. If you had a 120K job, for how long and how much would you have to make to quit the job Want to keep the same life standard? It's a weird question. You mean at poker? I don't know. You probably need to be making 250K or more. Something like that. Because, I mean, if you have a 120K job, presumably you have some um, benefits, I'm guessing. If you have benefits, what are those worth? You have stability, what's that worth? Right? I knew a guy who was a lawyer who used to work with my wife. He was a very good online player. He was winning like 500K a year. And he had a job as a lawyer making like 300K a year. And he just did both, right? <laughs> just grinded it hard, grinded hard on both of them. And uh, inevitably, he made lots of money. But then poker got tougher. He stopped winning so much money, and he was sure glad he had that job. Oh, let's see. Let's see. You like to 2.5x the range you play versus limpers to start to define the range, their range if they flat. I would usually just tell you to raise a little bit bigger to get more money in the pot, Louis Fleet, because if they're they're going to call and then just play straightforwardly after the flop a lot of the time. So you might as well just get more money in the pot because you're going to win more than your fair share of those pots with post-flop bets. Hope we have another 30-day challenge. We actually have four seven-day challenges lined up that we we're in the process of making. They're actually basically made. We were just in the process of finding a different way to present them that would be a little bit better so that we don't have to do a ton of programming every time. So that's it. What's my defending range from the big blind for a button three bet? Bad question, Kogan, because who raised? If someone raises in the button three bets, their three betting range depends on the raiser. So if like under the gun raises and then the button three bets, well, they should have a super nitty range. So big blind should defend almost never. But if Cutoff raises and button three bets, then you know big blind can start playing many more hands. Maybe that's not the question you're asking. Maybe you're asking if, what if they just raise? 
If they make a standard raise, then quite wide. But a three bet is a re-raise. Maniac says, the challenges are amazing. Poker coaching literally changed your life for the better. Well, that's great to hear. Tell all your friends. <laughs> you finished the master class. What should you study to be profitable at one, two after you finish? I have a bunch of classes under the um, under the courses section on how to play the small stakes cash games where I went and I played myself and recorded hands. Also, there are many quizzes on the site on small stakes cash games. Check out all of that. So we talked about minimum defense frequency. Basically, a lot of people try to apply it unnecessarily. A lot of people don't even know how to do the math right. And now you know how to do the math right. You may not know how to apply it necessarily, but really, most of your opponents are not going to be playing world-class poker. So funny enough, they have this app, uh, DTO. I like playing on it. They actually put out a challenge yesterday um, to see if you could get the maximum that their pro got, 65%. I was 1% off, got 64%. Which, um, you know, I guess pretty good. Currently, I guess in second place. And is that actually applicable for most people? I think the answer is no, 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 no. Someone sent me an email yesterday saying that he normally plays small stakes tournaments and cash games. He's canceling poker coaching premium because he wants to spend money on one of these apps that teach game theory optimal heads up strategy. And like that could literally be the worst thing you spend your money on if you're trying to beat small and medium stakes poker. Because, have you seen the ranges that they're saying your opponents are playing? No one's playing those ranges. Also, if you're playing small stakes games, you're going to be playing all sorts of multi-way pots, which none of these programs have programmed in because they don't have the numbers. And like, I just cannot believe the thought process of, I play small stakes games, so I'm going to go study something that is absolutely not applicable to me. Mind-boggling. But that is how some people think. They, they've been brainwashed by people say this word all the time and they should they should blindly follow these words. And please study things that are applicable to you. Please, 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 please. Am I playing at Commerce this month? No, I'm home with my wife and my family. Do I think this coronavirus will affect the World Series? Probably not. How do you deal with tilt? Don't go on tilt. Don't be a fish. Don't get excited. Don't get depressed realize that a lot of the nonsense that goes through your head is irrelevant. Richard makes a very obvious statement that is good, but you're missing the point, Richard. You think solvers are good for small stakes because you can program in ranges, no locking, etc. Yeah, but if you played with these apps that give you pre-programmed situations, they assume, at least at the moment, that both players play, first off, a specific range, which your opponents are not doing, and also, they presume the opponents are playing the GTO range, which your opponents are not doing. And that's going to lead you to making maniacal blunders. Maniacal blunders. And I hate to see any of my students just make absurd mistakes for no reason. And the idea of I'm going to sit there and play like this GTO solver program tells me in my small stakes games against players who have no clue how to play GTO poker, who are probably never bluffing the turn appropriately, who are probably never bluffing the river appropriately, if you do that, you're, you're just like giving your money away. Timex wants 12 to 1, and he's betting that the World Series would not happen at all. Ooh, I would take it at... You're, you're gonna... I have to bet 12 to win 1? I mean, that sounds like not so bad. Am I going to take action? No. Because I know what I don't know, Mark. You can know the lock, but you need to do it for every street. Callum, you're again missing the point. I'm not saying don't invest in a solver. I am saying don't invest in a GTO game that teaches you to play GTO against GTO players because your opponents are nowhere near GTO. They're not. They're not. I promise you. If you put in the effort and study really hard, poker coaching will literally turn your game around. It will indeed. What's my favorite trophy? I like this, this one. I like this one right here. Can you all see it? The one with the globe? Uh, I'm just gonna take off the globe. I would try to get the whole thing down, but I, I might drop it. It has this neat, neat globe. I will got, it's upside down, look at that. I got this for winning the Fox, Foxwoods World Poker Finals. I think that's what it was. 
Foxwoods World Poker Finals. They also gave me this nifty bracelet. World Poker Tour bracelet. Yeah. Yeah. We have two of those. Another one. There's another one hiding. So we have two two bracelets. Two little two little World Poker Tour bracelets. Those are neat and actually almost wearable. Almost. Not quite. Yesterday in the final two of a $2 tournament, you noticed when you lent the small blind, you didn't re-raise the aggro button. It was just folded. I, son, I'm not sure what you're saying. Oh, you're saying that you lent he raised? I would just call. Is the World Series bracelet coming soon? Probably not. Um, I mean, I'm always an under, everyone's an underdog to get a bracelet at the World Series if they don't play the mixed game events. Um, I think I did some math a long time ago. I was talking to JC Tran about this. I think he said if you play like all the no limit events, you're going to get a bracelet something like one out of seven years, give or take, if you're good. Uh, and, um, you know, I've played more than seven years. <laughs> but there's loads of variants, right? When you're playing thousand person tournaments, there's just infinite variants. So if you're one in seven years-ish for no limit events, if you play all of them, what if you actually don't play very many of them? I think this year, I'm actually not going to play many at all. Let me see what my schedule is. I'll tell you my schedule. I roughly have it already lined up. I'm going to play a 25K on the 29th of May. Then I'm going to play 15K World Poker Tour Tournament of Champions on the 31st. Then I'm going to play a 1K Turbo, and then I'm leaving. Three tournaments in and out right at the beginning. Then I'm going to go back at the end to play the main events, maybe 10K online, although I'm probably going to have a company retreat that day instead. Then there's a 1K, a 5K, no limit hold'em in PLO, 1500 bounty. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm going to play. I'm, I'm getting back on the 20, 28th. That's it. So they have a mystery bounty, then 10K, 6 max, then main event. Basically, let me look, count these. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I'm going to play 12 World Series events this year, most likely. That's not very many. So if you only play 12, what are your odds of winning a 1,000-person tournament with, with uh, 12 shots? Well, let's get out the calculator. Let's assume I'm actually really good, so I'm going to win 1 in 500. I'm, gonna, I'm 1 in 500, right? 1 divided by 500 equals times 12. This is how often I win a bracelet this year. 2.4% of the time. It's not a whole lot. So one in uh, 40 times I do this, I'll get a bracelet. That's nice. It's all math. You sent me an email two weeks ago. Did I get it? I don't know. Send it again. If you didn't get a reply, I probably didn't get it. Do I have an idol or a mentor? I have plenty of mentors. I don't know if I have any idols. I have plenty of mentors, though. I have a lot of friends in the poker space. Wouldn't necessarily call many of them mentors at this point. I've had coaches. Nice way to get a mentor is to pay them money. <laughs> I've had plenty of coaches. Every time I go to learn a new game, I hire a new, I hire a coach who's really good at that game, who I know is good at explaining their thought processes. And that has been very, very, very beneficial for me. And I would definitely suggest all of you do that. If you're not already crushing your game, you're wasting your time by just sitting there and grinding it over and over and over again. You'd be much better off spending some money to get better because you're taking all of the coach's experience and condensing it down to exactly what you need in a short period of time. There's like nothing more you could really ask for. And if you do that, you are just going to be way ahead of everybody else right off the bat. And you'd rather start way ahead of everybody than not way ahead of everybody. And you should do this for everything in your life, right? Like if you're new to going to the gym, hire a trainer. If you are going to go hiking and you've never been somewhere and you want to know the best hiking places, hire a guide, right? If um, you want to learn to drive race cars, hire a race car driving coach, right? You know, hire a coach for whatever you're going to do. I mean, I've hired coaches for Magic Gathering. I've hired coaches for Hearthstone because it costs like 30 bucks an hour and you're going to be a million times better at the game. And if you care about being good at things, which I like being good at things and enjoying myself and not wasting my time, then... You might as well do that, right? What's minimum defense frequency depend on? Depends on your pot. It depends on the raise size and it depends on, well, if you're looking at just straight GTO, it depends on the raise size and how much you have to call, right? I mean, I already showed you the equation. Minimum defense frequency, minimum defense frequency equals one minus 
the opponent's bet, not counting any money they already have in the pot, divided by the opponent's total bets plus the pot. And then you kind of divide that by the players you have to act based on how likely they are to defend. So um, what's it depend on? Your opponent's bet and the size of the pot. Oh, you all can't see that. Yeah, there you go. Opponent's bet and the size of the pot is what it depends on. Everyone sure wants to talk about if the World Series is going to be canceled. I highly doubt it will be. You just got mastering small stakes and holding them. Great. Hope you're enjoying it. Let's see. You found that whenever you play poker, you really do well. You get up some money, and then something happens, and you lose your edge, and you lose it all back. What do you do? Well, stop playing too long of sessions. Play shorter sessions. Where in the Hamas can you play cash games? You probably can't. I don't think they have poker there normally. But they have poker there during the Party Poker Caribbean Poker Party in November. Take a trip. Go there. Stay at Baja Mar. You can play poker a lot, and it's a whole lot of fun. If you ever go to a casino, or you're going somewhere like, let's say, Aruba or the Bahamas or anywhere, literally anywhere, call ahead of time to make sure they have a, a poker table if you want to go play poker. Because you may be very disappointed otherwise. Just because places have tournaments does not mean they have poker games there normally. Um, especially that's true for like European poker tour and party poker tour stops because very often they don't go to casinos. They go to nice resorts. Sometimes they go to casinos, but like Bahamar, right? It's a nice casino, but they don't have a poker room. But during the poker tournament, they have tons of poker, right? Do you skew minimum defense frequency to take range advantage into account? You should account for equity realization. But you're going to find that most hands that are reasonable are going to realize their correct amount of equity. Are there times where it doesn't apply? Yeah, whenever your opponent's range is really strong. I already told you the early example. Someone raises under the gun. You call big blind with a wide range. Flop comes ace, king, four. You check, they bet. You should be drastically under defending because they have all the nuts and you have no nuts. And all your hands that you have are going to be really hard to get to the river or get to the showdown, right? So minimum defense frequency does not apply when you are at a significant range or nut advantage and or nut advantage. It also doesn't apply when other parts of your range can be played in such a profitable manner that you're fine giving up on the rest of it. This comes up in weird spots on the river where if you have a lot of nut hands, and you have some junk. Sometimes the right play is to just jam all of your nuts and the appropriate amount of bluffs. But then that'll leave like 10% of your bluffs just like hanging out to dry. So you check the bluffs that have the most showdown value with the idea that you're just check folding almost all of them. It's never a good idea from a psychological warfare standpoint to show a big bluff. Sure. How do you calculate minimum defense frequency at the table? You shouldn't do that. You don't need to be doing that because you studied ahead of time, Polly. Also, minimum defense frequency is something that, like, I'm never thinking about that at the table. It's already baked into all of the ranges and strategies that I use. Whenever you study poker from a good poker player, all of the math behind the strategy is already built in. Like with GTO preflop ranges, for example, it's all built in already. If you raise with the ranges that are listed, and you get 3-bet, you will be able to defend at minimum defense frequency in all standard scenarios. So what gets people into, pro into trouble is that they play way too wide of ranges, or they play their ranges in such a way that one side of their range is very weak. Like, for example, at, um, at PokerCoaching.com, we have a homework challenge each month where sometimes you're betting and sometimes you're checking, right? When you check, sometimes I'll look at people's checking range as just all garbage, like their betting range looks good and strong, but that's because their checking range is so junk. And if your checking range is all junk, then you just lose every time you check. And you obviously don't want to lose every time you check. How do you play monotone board out of position? Someone called you in the middle set because you checked the flop, bet ace turn, river was a four flush, and you bluffed. How do you play it? Um, bluff when you don't have showdown value and when they should not have too many nut hands in their range. But realize that like sets are, are supposed to call down sometimes because especially if it's a bunch of like high spades out there that are high flush cards out there then you probably don't have a ton of them right also a lot of people will assume when you're betting the turn and the river you're betting with a very polarized range like only the ace or only the king 
And um, if you're if that is what you're doing, and you're also betting with a lot of bluffs, you have too many bluffs in your range. How do you commit ranges to memory? You don't. I don't think you necessarily need to commit them to memory. You just need to reference them a ton. Like whenever you're playing, if you don't know the ranges decently well, look at them in literally every single spot and make sure you're not screwing up. Great way to do this. Just play online. Play online. Tiny stakes. Play money. Doesn't matter. And every situation you have where you don't definitively know the answer, look at the charts. And assume you don't know the answer for like the first four hours of this experiment. So look at the chart every single time. Do that every single time, over and over and over again. And eventually you're going to know most of the spots. And then maybe you just have um, you know, problems with you know, things on the cusp, right? And then eventually you'll know those. Like push fold charts, right? I... I mean, I don't know if I know it perfectly now, but I used to know it perfectly. And it's because I was using them literally every single day. Is it terrible to open jam pocket sixes under the gun four-handed so you're in the cutoff seat for 22 big blinds? Um, it's probably okay. Do you like that book, Modern Poker Theory? Yes, I love the book, Modern Poker Theory. I helped make it. Do you think it applies to live donkaments? So this mindset here is very, very poor. If you call a tournament a donkament, you're basically saying... I don't recognize, well, first off, if you're, let, let's think about this, right? You're calling something a document and you play it. So by theory, you must be a donk, right? Why would you be playing it? Otherwise, you have a giant bankroll if the games were that soft. So you're already demeaning your opponents. You do not want to disrespect your opponents because presumably, if you're not beating these games or you're barely beating these games, you're not much better than them. So don't demean yourself, right? Especially if you're here, you're up early in the morning, you're doing work, trying to get better at the game, then realize these are tournaments. You should not, you should not have a negative vision of yourself. Just be very careful with that. But does learning how to play fundamentally sound and how to adjust apply to any tournament? Absolutely. The Drawing Dead, good morning. Hope you're having a great, great day. Have a great weekend. You have a great weekend too. Ace King calls now post flop after continuation bet. Uh, yeah, if the board's very uncoordinated, it definitely should. You want to be calling down with your marginal made hands in spots where a lot of draws miss. We discussed this thoroughly at the Cash Game Masterclass at PokerCoaching.com. Check it out. We explain all this. If you're excited to see the breakdown today with me and Michael Acevedo. Yeah, Michael Acevedo. He wrote Modern Poker Theory. He is going to be analyzing my hands from a thousand dollar tournament. I took third place in. About a month ago, and I'm um, kind of nervous because I don't know what he's going to say. I asked him to send me the hands ahead of time so I could at least halfway prepare myself, and he didn't. So uh, it's going to be a surprise. Should you always buy in maximum? No, absolutely not. The times you want to buy in max, well, the times you don't want to buy in maximum are when you don't think you're better than your opponents, right? If you don't think you're better than your opponents, then you should buy in minimum, right? You also don't want to buy in maximum when the guy on your left has a lot of chips because you lose chips to the players on your left. So if you're going to lose big stacks to the guy on your left but only win small stacks from the guy on your right, then that's bad for you. So if the guy on your right has very few chips and the guy on your left has a lot of chips, you want to buy in to cover the guy on your right. Also, who's bad, right? If um, you know the players are bad on your across the table, you have a lot of good players on your left, well, it's a pretty tough spot to be in. I played on live at the bike. Yeah, quite a few times. Your reg at two five in Arizona. You played your first tournament, made it day two, but felt very outmatched. Well, first of all, I'd say to play smaller buy-in tournaments. Why are you starting at already a relatively high buy-in tournament? You need to get a lot of experience playing first before you hop into the bigger game. So, any tips? Study tournaments. If you're a cash game reg. Don't be so egotistical to think that you can hop into a live tournament and do well because you have not studied tournaments. You need to make sure you study tournaments if you're going to play tournaments. Just like if you're going to play Pot Limit Omaha, you need to study Pot Limit Omaha. Any books help you catch up on tournament strategies? Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. Only 85 likes and 220 people here. Come on, everyone. Click like, click subscribe. How much is the Cash Game Masterclass? Hmm, I don't know what it is right now. Every once in a while I'll have a sale, but it's part of Poker Coaching Premium. And you can get that at pokercoaching.com slash premium. That's 100 bucks a month. And you get access to that plus 
all sorts of stuff. Will this tournament class be out before the World Series? Yes, I'm going to record it in mid-March. I'm having a retreat. I'm bringing out one of my friends who is a world-class teacher, and he has a tutoring site where he teaches people how to teach. So he's going to be teaching me and some of the other poker coaching coaches who can be there how to be better teachers. So we're going to learn that. He's going to break down what I give to him, tell me what's good, tell me what's bad, and he's going to make this course great. Currently, it's very big. I'm actually kind of um, scared at how big it is. It's currently 458 slides. It's going to be probably 70 or 80 parts. They're short. The parts are going to be shorter. Possible parts are going to be like 5 to 10 minutes long each for the most part. They're going to have a bunch of quizzes in between to make sure you understand it. So, yeah. Any suggestions for live satellite play? Ask yourself why you're playing them and what the purpose is. Figure that out. Mark, why are you playing satellites? Because that's actually going to answer a lot of your questions. Is live poker better to build your game than online? No, online is definitely a better way to get good because when you play online, you are playing against better players. That said, you're playing tinier stakes, the games are tougher, you're not going to have a very big win rate, etc., etc. Is Ace Jack suited bad fold for 15 big blinds? Depends on the scenario, John. Did it go raise all in before you? If that's the case, then no. Oh, goodness, goodness. Jeremy, I'm not sure what you're saying. I guess what you're saying is you've learned very good exploitative poker and you're trying to learn how to play more fundamentally sound. You feel lost. Well, they're different games, different concepts, right? What do I think about this cash out feature? I think it's great if you don't like money. If you want to give away your money to poker stars, then it's a great way to do it. You can't afford direct buy-in to a tournament, so you want to parlay and try to get rich. All right, I have an article for you. Let's see. Why I tell my students to not play satellites. There you go. Here's a link. Have I ever tried poker VR? I have not, but it's probably fun. Here's a link. Why I tell my students not to play satellites. I will sum it up for you. Basically, when you play a satellite, you're trying to parlay into a bigger tournament you have no reason to actually be playing. Because presumably, if you don't have the buy-in for it, you're not good enough to play it. Sorry, but it's true. If you don't have the buy-in to play bigger, it presumes that you either have not put in any time at all grinding, or you're just not all that good. Because if you have put in the time, you would have the bankroll to play. So, you're playing for fun. And you're playing for excitement. If you want to play for fun and excitement, then maybe you don't even need to worry about playing good poker. Maybe you just need to be goofing off and having fun. Joey Ingram posted something the other day that like it's important to realize why you're playing poker. And if you're playing for fun, then screw it, right? You don't need to play well. Do whatever you want. Goof off. Throw away your money. If that's, if that's what you're actually trying to do. Now, if you actually do care about getting better, I would tell you to play within your bankroll. Because think about what happens when you play a satellite. You play the satellite for, let's say, $100. You win the satellite one in eight times if you're good. Great. Then you play a tournament that's way bigger than you're used to. So you're going to be out of your comfort zone already. And then you're going to cash out one out of eight times. So now we're one in 64 to get any money back. You know how many buy-ins you need to play tournaments where you're only going to cash one in 64 times? And even then, it's just a min cash, right? So you get back 1500 bucks or something. Um... You, I mean, I, I don't even know how many buy-ins you need. Like, a thousand? I don't know. It's fun, right? So if you need a thousand buy-ins, you really have a thousand buy-ins? Well, obviously not. So you're playing for fun. You're goofing off. So if you're goofing off and just trying to get rich, try to get lucky, then, you know, satellites are a great way to try to get rich and get lucky, but realize you're probably never going to have a bankroll, and you're probably never going to move up in stakes, and you're probably never going to become a good poker player. Is that a little too harsh? <laughs> That's probably a little too harsh. Um... It's true, though. So anyway, tips for playing satellites. I actually have that in my master class. Tips for playing satellites. Essentially, you need to play normally in the early levels. Once you get some chips, tighten up a bit, right? The goal is to get in the money. There's a chapter by Bernard Lee in Excelling at No Limit Hold'em. 
one second. I'll, I'll actually give it to you because it's in my it's in my master cash game class. Just let me find it real quick. Hmm. There's a section on backing in there, a section on deal making, a section on progressive knockout tournaments. Ah, satellites. Here we go. Um, okay, here's the average number of seats, or average number of chips you're going to need when... I'll just post this and see if that'll work. Uh, that didn't work so well. Okay, so average here's your, the fi the final level of the tournament will be this equation. The big blind at the final level of the tournament will be this number. The number of entries needed for one seat times the number of starting chips divided by ten. That's going to be the final level on most satellites. So once you get up to anywhere near that amount, um, you really need to go on lockdown mode. What's the best way to snuff out a backdoor trader flush draw? Are they putting all their money in the pot? <laughs> I have Omaha experience. Yeah, of course I do. I say, of course I do. I've spent about six months at least playing most games. And um, PLO, I actually play a lot more because I thought it might be the game of the future about 10 years ago, five, eight years ago, something like that. Turns out it wasn't. Turns out it's kind of a, it's a good gambling game, but um, we're not gambling here. And there's loads and loads of variants in it. And it's a bad game live, I think, because it's very slow. So it's not, not a particularly great game. You disagree with satellites not being profitable. Michael, did you hear a word I just said? I did not say satellites were not profitable. Satellites are profitable. You think poker stars will be allowed back in Nevada ever? Uh, yeah, eventually. Why, why do people take words I, I say and they like completely try to screw them up? I said that they are not good if you want to be a long-term winning professional poker player. Obviously, you profit. Did you listen to the equation I gave? I said you're one in eight to cash. I said you're profiting in the satellites. If you're one in eight to cash in a satellite where one in 10 get in the money, you're making money every time you play. The problem though, is that then you're playing a tournament where you probably don't have much of an edge and you're just like variances through the roof. And that's not good if you want to make money long-term. It's good if you want to try to get lucky, but it's not good for making money long-term. Satellites are great if you want to be able to win a trip and go play a poker tournament. Satellites are great if you want to try to parlay a small amount of money into a lot. Satellites are great if you have no desire to play for a living and you just want to treat this like a get-rich-quit scheme. If that's how you want to approach poker, satellites are amazing. And fortunately, that's how most people approach poker. So, good. Get in there and do that. I will say that some people say, oh, you can have big edges in satellites. You can if your opponents are bad. The problem, though, is that the game actually isn't all that hard, which is why the satellites online and the high stakes are very near unbeatable. Satellites and small stakes are still beatable, but the high stakes ones are basically unbeatable. And it's just a bunch of people who came up from the small stakes games. I haven't been on a poker cruise. I've been on a few poker cruises. I've given classes on poker cruises. They're fun if you like playing poker. How does online compare to live right now? Online's a million times tougher. You can talk about poker coaching and what you can learn there. Go to pokercoaching.com, sign up for it. It's completely for free to get a trial. And if you want to sign up for the full membership. If you don't like it after a month, cancel, because if I don't help you, I don't deserve your money. And I don't want your money. And go there, sign up, it's completely free. Well, free to get the trial. I would tell you, sign up for the full $100 a month poker coaching premium. If you don't like it after a month, cancel, and they'll give you your money back. I have to go now. I'm having a webinar today. I am... Um, I'm doing a webinar with Michael Acevedo today, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Check it out. If you miss it, there'll be a replay on YouTube. And we will be going through some hands that I played in a very tough $1,000 online tournament. I took third place in recently. It's actually really fun. The payouts were um, $15,000 for first, $9,000 for second, $6,000 for third. And that was it. <laughs> Talk about a silly bubble, huh? I don't know why they did that. That's how it was. Have I played Poker Stars fast games? Yeah, they're tough. I was a winner in them, but they were tough. I actually have some of uh, myself playing 50 cent dollar and one two fast games on party poker at pokercoaching.com and the very new course they just put out. I forget what it's called. Send me an email, support at pokercoaching.com. We'll get you a link if you're a member. Have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. I will see you all either at 4 p.m. or bright and early Monday for another episode of Little Coffee. Thanks for being here. Good luck in your games. Have fun.